This evening, as you know, we're going to continue with uh, our, our look at Augustine. I want to this evening build on what Pastor started Wednesday night when he uh, gave us sort of an overview of the times in which Augustine was there. And I want to use these next two sessions to look at him through two specific lenses. And if I had to say what was going to happen this evening and tomorrow night, if there was one overall theme, I think the theme would be uh, about coming to God, coming to God. And the first, the first aspect of that, we're going to look at the Confessions of Augustine, his, one of his more famous books. And this shows how an individual comes to God. And tomorrow, we will look at one of his, probably the most famous book called The City of God, and how societies come to God, and, and, and masses come to God. But coming to God was uh, the important theme that kind of holds these, these two things together. <clears throat> um, Augustine is famous for, for really uh, four books, I think, is her, his most famous writings. One's called On Christian Doctrine, the other one's called The Incridian on Faith, Hope, and Love, and then there's the Trinity, and then there is the city of God. Uh, I would also throw confessions in there. Um, the confessions, the book Confessions, was written when he was about 40 years old, and, uh, or in his mid-40s. And he, he wrote this book as an autobiography. That's kind of strange, because in that day, there was no such thing as an autobiography or a biography, really, um, in the way we think of it. And so it was his own ter interpretation of his life that was about two-thirds over, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. He died when he was uh, 76 years old. So uh, this covers the first 40 years of a 76-year-old's of a life. This is, this is the story about how God saved him. And it's different than what we would consider an autobiography, probably, because... He not only tells the facts of his life, which a modern autobiography does, he not only tries to interpret those, which a modern autobiography does, but he also tries to see the hand of God in all the scenes of his life, which, which would sound a little bit strange to us, but he, he, gave, uh, he gave an example of this, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit of an example of why he wrote, and, and Part of the screens tonight, I'm just going to put up quotes from the book for the most part. <clears throat> and the reason is, one of the reasons I'm putting up quotes is I want you to see how accessible it is. Uh, Confessions is probably the best and easiest book to read from Augustine. You don't have to know a lot going in. The language is not too hard, as you'll see tonight. But this is, this is what he gave us his understanding about why he wrote. He said, to whom am I narrating all this? Not to thee, O oh my God, but to my own kind in thy presence to that small part of the human race who may chance to come upon these writings, and to what end that I and all who read them may understand what depths there are from which we are to cry unto thee. Confessions is not only a story of his own conversion, and not, it was not only meant to encourage conversion, but in the end it becomes this paradigm of how we are to un understand our own conversions. You're going to see your conversion in his conversion because the way he spells out his conversion tends to have been passed down, and, and it's sort of the, the pattern that we understand ourselves in. And, and uh, what you have is <coughs> Augustine extrapolating from his own experience other people's journey. One of the most important concepts is the idea that God is in all the events of our lives. He recognized that God has always protected and guided him, not just taking care of him in a spiritual way, or excuse me, in a physical way, but he's carried to him on a spiritual journey. Now, if you were to pick up the Confessions, it's really not that big of a book. It's broken down into what is called 13 books. It's called books, but we'd really call them chapters. The, the, these books are chapter length. And you could really read through this in a couple of hours if you were just going straight through it, uh, if you want to plow through it. But some of the ideas, you probably wouldn't do that. It, they're worth thinking over, meditating. They're not hard. But it just, he, he, the way he words things, he makes you just sort of meditate on that. Well, of these 13 books or chapters, nine of them are autobiog autobiographical and tell what he was doing at different times. The last four are sort of a commentary that looks back on that. The form of it is kind of interesting because it's written 
a lot to God. It, it sounds like a prayer that goes on. And sometimes he feel, you feel like he's talking to you, and sometimes you feel like he's talking to God, and you're listening to his prayers. <coughs> he, starts, <coughs> he starts each one of these chapters in a conversational prayer, and he, he describes what he's about to explain. One of the most quoted of these was on the first title page of the PowerPoint, <clears throat> and it reads, For thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee. And uh, you find that quoted in different places. But in most of these prayers, he either marvels at God or, or is thankful for God. So let's get into what's going on here. Pastor mentioned that Augustine was born in North Africa. Here's a map here. Uh, this, this map right here controls most of, well, all of his life. All of his life happened within this box. And um, he was born in a small town that is right here. Sometimes it's spelled with a T-H, sometimes with a T, without the H, but it's called Thagaste. And um, the, book, the book starts pretty funny because it tells of his infancy and, you know, if you're writing autobiography, you don't think about writing your, your, about your infancy. And, of course, he can't remember his infancy. So what he does is he looks at other babies and how they act, and he goes, I must have been the same way. So he's like, that's what I was like in my infancy. And um, this, is, this is a close-up of, of where he was born. That, that city right there, this is the Mediterranean Sea, and that's the tip of Sicily, okay? So he's right on the edge of the Mediterranean, as pastor's already said. Listen to what he said. Uh, about babies, and particularly himself. He says, well, the main thing he sees in babies is selfishness. <laughs> and he says, this is how I was. This exemplifies the baby, basic biblical teaching of sin nature. Babies get violent when they're not given what they deserve, right? And he calls this original sin. This is one quote, for it's from thee, O God, that all good things come, and from my God is all health. And this is what I have since learned, that thou hast made it abundantly clear by all that I have seen uh, the give both to me and those around me for even at the first I knew how to suck how to lie quiet when I was full and to cry when in pain nothing more God gave him that but he had nothing more than that and from the beginning he had nothing and he could do nothing there was one exception he says and so I would fling my arms and legs about and cry making the few and feeble gestures that I could though indeed the signs were not much like what I inwardly desired and when I was not satisfied, either from not being understood or because I, what I got was not good for me, I grew indignant that my elders were not subject to me and that those on whom I actually had no claim did not wait on me as slaves, and I avenged myself by crying. <laughs> and uh, I have six kids, and that's exactly what we do, right? So from the beginning, we are sinfully selfish. He traces what he calls original sin right back to the crib. Was it a good thing for me to try by struggling as hard as I could to harm them for not obeying me, even when it would have done me harm to have been obeyed? Thus the, innocent, the infant's innocent lies in the weakness of his body and not in the infant mind. I myself observed a baby to be jealous, though he could not speak it. I, it was livid as it watched another infant at the breast. For although we allow for such things in an infant, the same things could not be tolerated patiently in an adult. Right? He says, the only thing that keeps a baby looking innocent is his physical form. If you can get inside him, he's a tyrant, right? Well, <clears throat> as he grew, he pursued uh, pleasure as, as he got a little bit older. Other aspects of sin marked him as growing as a child, and he remembers how he was always desiring pleasure, fun and games over his school responsibilities, and especially in his study of scripture that his mother gave him. And he saw these appetites as indicative of his spiritual life. He would scam his parents and teachers in order to spend more time with his friends having fun. And he understood this blind pursuit of pleasure as sin. Now, he didn't understand it completely as a kid, but as a 40-year-old looking back on how he used to just scheme to get out and have some fun, he saw that as being sinful. And uh, from what he says, he must have been a handful at school. He says, thus as a boy... I began to play, to, uh, again, to pray to thee, my help and my refuge, and calling on thee, broke the bands of my tongue. In other words, I just started to speak when I was praying. Small as I was, I prayed with no slight earnestness that I might not be beaten at school. 
And, and when thou did not heed me, for thou would have been giving over to me to my folly, my elders and even my parents too, who wished me no ill, treated my stripes as a joke, though they were then great and grievously ill to me. His first prayers were, Lord, please stop the beatings. That's, that's what they were. His first prayers are to have relief from those who were punishing him, both at school and at home. And he says, <clears throat> what made it worse was that he noted that his teachers and parents had the same fun-loving desires that he had. They just pursued different things. And so it seemed incredibly hypocritical to him that he should get in trouble pursuing his pleasures while the adults were pursuing theirs and not getting in trouble. Right? He says, he says it like this. For I did not, O Lord, lack memory or capacity, for by thy will possessed enough for my age. However, my mind was absorbed in play, and I was punished for this by those who were doing the same things themselves. But the idling of our elders is called busyness. The idling, the idling of boys, though quite like it, is punished by those same elders. And no one pities either the boys or the men. So nothing changed. It says, uh, I disobeyed them, not because I had chosen a better way, but from a sheer love of play. I loved the vanity of the victory, and I loved to have my ears tickled with lying fables, which made them even itch more ardently, and, so, and a similar curiosity glowed more and more in my eyes for the shows and the sports of my elders. He, he was just your typical kid who was going after pleasure as hard as he could. But one of the things you're going to see develop in his life is this understanding of pleasure being the marker of, of who you worship and what you worship, okay? And as an adult 40-year-old, he looks back on this, and he sees that as sinfully pursuing pleasure. At home, he had mixed messages coming from his parents. <coughs> he had one, pa <clears throat> as Pastor said, he had one parent, his mother, who was a, a believer, and his father's name was Patricius, who was a farmer. He was probably a middle-class farmer. His father was a provider, but his father was only interested in him doing one thing, and that's getting a good education. That was it. And he tolerated a lot of foolishness from uh, Augustine, but he didn't hammer the foolishness as long as he was doing well in school, right? And he said, uh, well, here's what he says about, uh, here's, here's one thing he says about his adults. Thus at that time, I believed, he puts believes in quotes, along with my mother and the whole household, except my father. My father was not a believer. He did not overcome the influence of my mother's piety in me, uh, nor did he prevent my believing in Christ, though he had not believed it himself. For it was her desire, O oh my God, that I would acknowledge thee as my father rather than him, in, whose, in this thou didst aid her to overcome her husband, to whom, through his, though, his superior, though his superior, she yielded in obedience. This was the way she also yielding in obedience to thee, who does so command." His mother was a bigger influence in his life than his father. But his mother, while she was a bigger influence, was, was obedient to his father, and though, uh, so she yielded in obedience. What you really are going to see is that Monica had her handful not only with her son, but with her husband. And um, they had an interesting relationship in which she was trying to convert everybody in the house, and he was not working with her, and then she was trying to be obedient but it didn't quite work out all the time. Later, his father gets saved right before he dies. Um, it says, But herein lay my sin, that it was not in him, but his creatures, myself and the rest, that I sought for pleasures, honors, and truths, and fell thereby in sorrows, troubles, and errors. Thanks be to thee, my, my joy and my pride, my confidence, my God. Thanks be to thee for thy gifts, but, thou do, but do thou preserve them in me. For thus wilt thou preserve me, and those things which thou hast given me shall be developed and perfected, and I myself shall be with thee, from this, it, for thee uh, is my being. When he gets a little bit older, he gets moved to a school in Madura. And uh, Madura is just uh, 15 miles south of where he lived. What did I just do? So he, he lives right here. He went 15 miles south down this road where he goes to school. <clears throat> he stays into school from ages 11 to 15, and then he spent his 16th year at home. Now, you have to understand, at this time, the, the, the idea of a teenager was not invented yet. You were either a child or you were an adult, okay, which is going to explain some things that go on. But during this, uh, this time, 
uh, there were two sins that marked him pretty deeply as an adolescent. And he handles them in a very curious manner in the book. The first involved a pear. And uh, Augustine comes from a middle class family and never wanted for food. He had everything he needed. However, one time he's with a group of boys. They weren't his best friends, but they were kind of hung out together. And he and his friends stole some pears from an orchard. <clears throat> this bothered him greatly as an adult. When he was looking back on this, he, he spent a lot of time trying to understand what was going on in his little teenage head while he was stealing those pears. And it just didn't make sense, no matter how you broke it down. He had, at that same time, better pears at home, right? And, and, and so it wasn't for the love of the pears. As a matter of fact, they ate some of what they stole, but they ended up giving most of it to pigs as they, as they left. They didn't even keep the pears, right? And, and so they didn't have great beauty when you compared it to things like wisdom or justice. Uh, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't even have great physical beauty, really. And so they're not that attractive. What attracted him to that? <coughs> he realized that most likely he would not have stolen anything if he wouldn't have been with his friends. The fact with his friends made him go to steal it. But you know what? He wasn't trying to please his friends either. He wasn't trying to win their respect. He wasn't that close to them. And, and he can't blame it on the friends. He said it wasn't their fault. He says, yet alone, I would not have done it. I would not have done it at all. The conclusion he came to was that as he was, as he was sinning by stealing and eating these pears, he was chasing after things that were feelings and experiences. And, and most of the time, these feelings and experiences were short-lived and they were rotten. But, but what, he, what he really wanted could only be found in God. And so what he said was, I'm stealing these things, but it's just for the pleasure of sinning. It's, it's just because I want to do something I shouldn't do, that I stole them. I wanted to work against God. And, and the problem for him was not the theft of the item, but that he loved it for the wrong reasons. He says, and as the theft itself was nothing, I was all the more wretched in that I loved it so. Yet by myself alone, I would not have done it. Still, I recall how I felt about this then. I could not have done it alone. I loved it then because of the companionship of my accomplices with whom I did it. I did, it, I did not, therefore, love the theft alone. Yet indeed, it was only the theft that I loved, for the companionship was nothing. And then he comes away from, from this by saying, <clears throat> but since the pleasure I got was not from the pears, it was in the crime itself, enhanced by the companionship of my, of, of my fellow sinners. Yet I had the desire to commit a robbery and did so, compelled it neither by hunger or poverty, but, the, th but through contempt for well-doing and strong impulse to iniquity. For I pilfered something which I had already had sufficient in measure and much better quality. I did not desire to enjoy what I stole, but only the theft and the sin itself. Now, from these little incidences, his baby, his babyhood and the selfishness that the baby has, and this, this little picture of the pear here, can you see why when later in his life Pelagius comes up and says, Adam really doesn't do much with original sin other than set a bad example. And we have the bad example of Adam and the good example of Christ, and you're free to choose who you want. That's what Pelagius said. Augustine looks back on his childhood, and he knows that can't be right, even from his own experiences. And, and just in knowing yourself, even if you didn't know one word of Scripture, just by knowing yourself, you know that's not how I sin. I don't sin making a rational choice based on my examples before me. I sin because I love sinning. I love the taking, right? <clears throat> well, the second huge issue of this time and it's an ongoing problem, had to do with sexual lusts. This remains a huge problem for him, okay? It says, uh, <clears throat> For as much as I, I became a youth, I longed to be satisfied with the worldly things, and I dared to grow wild in a succession of my various and shadowy loves. My form wasted away, and I became corrupt in thy eyes, yet I was still pleasing to my own eyes and eager to please the eyes of men. Listen to this quote. The, let me see if it's here. The mists of passion 
steamed up out of the puddly concupiscence of the flesh and the hot imagination of puberty, and they so obscured and overcast my heart that I was unable to distinguish the pure affection from the unholy desire. Both boiled confusedly within me and dragged my unstable youth down over the cliffs of unchaste desires and plunged me into a gulf of infamy. He, he, he gets sexually active at a young age. Now, again, remember, there's no such thing as a teenager, right? And so he's a man by their standards, okay? And one of the problems was is that nobody seemed to care. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. A lot of people didn't seem to care how he was doing or what he was doing sexually except his mother, and they let him go because he got good grades. Really. He said his father wanted to put all of those problems off for the sake of his education. His mother he was frustrated at because she wouldn't find him a wife. Okay, he's about 16. She won't find him a wife, and she should have already been working on that. And, and his, his father is just like, keep getting those good grades. You know, keep getting those good grades. <clears throat> his father worked extremely hard to get him around the best tutors that were available in that small town send him to the best school he could find, and then later send him to a better school that he could find, right? This is how he describes it. Meanwhile, my family took no care to save me from, but from ruin by marriage, for their sole care was that I should learn how to make it a uh, powerful speech and become a persuasive orator. Father troubled himself not at all as long as how I was progressing towards thee, nor how chaste I was, just so long as I was skillful in speaking, no matter how barren I was. <clears throat> At that time, he was studying what's called rhetoric, which means the art of speaking. It's not just speaking, uh, like making speeches, but it's the logic and how you construct your speech. It's the persuasiveness of it. It's the way you deliver it. It has a, it, it, it's the way that... Uh, a lot of people made their money at that time, whether you were a lawyer, a politician, a teacher. The idea of rhetoric was important, okay? And that's what he studied. And as long as he was doing well at rhetoric, his dad was happy. It was not that he was overwhelmed with lust, but he was also acting on it, all right? He was sleeping with many women, and everybody knew it. And while this was going on, his mother was trying to get him to uh, stop these sinful pursuits. Uh, they sent him to Carthage to fall to further his education, and his mother told him two things when he went off to school. Don't commit fornication, and don't seduce other men's wives. That, that's the message as he goes to college. The reason she told him this was that he was sexually active from a young age, and when he was 17, he had what was a mistress or a concubine that stayed with him for a long time. I mean, he had a long-term relationship at that point. <coughs> At that time, women were marrying at age 14. Men were usually a little bit older, but, but uh, everybody was marrying younger than we're used to. Um, as, as, as he grew up and got older, he understood that his mother's voice, or his mother's words were actually the voice of God at that time for him, that the Lord was directing her, and he should have listened to her. He says, oh my God, while I, while I wander further away from thee, uh, did, thou, did thou really then hold thy peace? Then whose words were they but thine, which my mother, thy faithful handmaiden, thou didst pour into my ears? None of them, however, sank into my heart to, to make me do anything. Mom was talking, but I wasn't having it. He increased pursuing his lust as well as lying and trumping up his sins so that he could be praised by his friends. Uh, <clears throat> he says, I was being gratuitously wanton, not having no inducement to evil, but the evil itself. It was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own undoing, loved my error, not that for which I erred, but for the error itself. A depraved soul, falling away from security in thee to destruction in itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deed, but the shame itself. What he realized as an older man is that he is chasing after small pleasures of sin when God had rich pleasures of life. But he was rejecting the rich pleasures of life in order to pursue his sin. He, he says, Within, with thee is perfect rest, 
and life unchanging. He who enters into thee enters into the joy of his Lord and shall have no fear and shall achieve excellence in the, in the excellent. I fell away from thee, O oh my God, and in my youth I wandered too far from thee, my true support, and became myself a wasteland. In Matthew 5.21, Scripture says that there is a man who will hear his master say to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'll set you over much. Listen to this. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. The question is, would you rather have God's joy or would you rather produce your own joy? And Augustine saw that he would rather pursue the joys of the creation rather than pursue the joy of the creator who would give back the joys of creation. So at age 17, he goes to Car Carthage and he studies rhetoric. I think I have another map here. Carthage, as Pastor pointed out, is right on the edge of the sea. It's a seaport right there. You can't, you can't get any closer. <coughs> And as he goes there, he develops a love for wisdom through his exposure to Cicero's writings. Rhetoric is the art of speaking well in argument, and logic is to clarify what you're about to say, and this is what he's studying, right? Well, what he finds is he's got a new idol in education. He does really well at it, he gets around people who really enjoy it, and he gets around teachers who are really good at it. In studying, as well as his success, it inflated him with arrogance. He said, I was not in love as yet, but I was in love with love. I was looking for something to love. I was in love with loving and hated security in a smooth way, free from snares. Within me, I had a death, a dearth of that inner food, which is thyself, my God. He and his friends still didn't stop messing around. They kind of made this small gang in Carthage. They were called the Wreckers, and they would go and tear things up, just do vandalism and stuff like that. They would verbally insult people. And it's while he's at Carthage at age 17 that his father died. And this is kind of strange if you're reading Confessions because he says almost nothing about it other than he died. But his father had actually gotten saved uh, right before he died. And his mother was extremely grateful for that. And um, she, that just brought her great joy is about all, the only thing he said about it. Back in school, he changed from being... <clears throat> from being seduced by children's play to becoming raptured by the philosophy and the pride it can generate. It's ironic because his main interest was in the Roman philosopher Cicero. Augustine started looking at scripture, and then when Cicero warns with scripture not to be taken up with philosophy. These are, um, uh, well, let me, just, let me just read. I'll come to that in a minute. This is Cicero speaking. He says, in it, that's learning, is also manifest that most salutary admonition by the Spirit, spoken by thy good and pious servant, this is Paul, and this is Cicero quoting Paul, he says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. So Cicero from the grave in his writing said, Don't get enraptured with philosophy. Augustine, years later, gets enraptured with philosophy, reads right over this, and pays no attention, even though Cicero's his hero, right? <clears throat> but what is good about this is now he starts to listen to the content of what people are saying. It's not just about the style which he says it, but now he's going to work with the, with, in the realm of ideas. And, and that's somewhat better. And um, his mom had been on him forever to consider scripture, but he never really took it seriously. This was how he thought of Scripture as a 17-year-old. He says, When I then turned toward the Scriptures, there appeared to me to be quite unworthy to be compared with the dignity of Tully. That's Cicero's nickname, Tully. For my inflated pride was re repelled by their style, nor could the sharpness of my wit penetrate their inner meaning. Truly they were the sort to aid and growth the little ones, but I scorned to be a little one, and swollen with pride, I looked upon myself as fully grown. He's too smart to read the Bible. That's the problem. He's too smart. Okay. Um, Pastor mentioned that the brand of Christianity that he got hooked on was Manichean Christianity. And I should put that in quotes because Manichean is not really uh, Christianity. It was a it was a perversion of Christianity, as Pastor explained. 
they, there was a, a leader, pastor said this, who, who kind of wove different ideas together, called it a religion. He had a little bit of Christ in there, so he called it Christianity. Well, what draws Augustine to Manichaeism was that it, it appeared to deal well with the problem of evil. How, how do you explain evil? And, and Manichae, uh, Manny, the guy who led, Man, who, the founder of Manichaeism, seemed to have a, a good answer. <clears throat> but, thank you, thank you. But, even though he had a good answer to that problem, when you look at Manichaeism, I mean, uh, Augustine knew there was a problem. And, and he described it, he described it as the food in a dream. When you have a dream about food, it smells good, it looks good, and even tastes good in the dream. But it never is going to satiate your appetite. Your appetite's always going to be there. It'll never give you nourishment. So he looked back seeing that he was looking for God, but settling for anything, really. And, and God, by putting these Manichean ideas down, and it, it, he said this later. He said, I should have put that stuff down earlier. He said, it would have been better if I had just worshipped the sun, because at least God made the sun. You know, and so I, I, I should have just done that. And uh, he realized it was foolishness later. But um, while he seemed far from God, his mother Monica continued to pray for him and continued to be faithful. And uh, she had this dream. She was really worried about him. And she had this dream in which a man said to her, where you are now, Augustine's gonna, uh, Augustine is going to be. He will come to you. Is that me? Um, Augustine is going to be. And uh, when she looked up in the dream, Augustine was standing right beside her. And she took that to mean that he was going to come into Christianity like she was. Now, you know, I don't believe in dreams like that, but she did. It said, nearly nine years passed in which I wallowed in the mud, that deep pit and darkness of falsehood, striving often to, to rise, but being all the more heavily dashed down. But all that time, this chaste, pious, and sober widow, such as thou dost love, was now more buoyed up with hope, though no less zealous in her weeping and mourning. And she did not cease to bewail my cause before thee. In all the hours of her supplication, her prayers entered thy presence, and yet thou didst allow me to still tumble and toss around in the darkness. So his mom prayed, and he kept sinning. Well, from ages 30, or excuse me, 19 to 30, Augustine was a teacher of rhetoric. This was his life before becoming a monk and then a bishop. Listen to how he describes this part of his life. This is, this is some educational disillusionment right here. It says, during this period of nine years, from my 19th year to my 28th, I went astray and led others astray. I was deceived and deceived others. In various lustful projects, some publicly by the teaching of of what, men, of what men style the liberal arts, sometimes secretly under the false guise of religion. In the one, I was proud of myself, and the other superstitious in all vain. In my public life, I was striving after the emptiness of popular fame, going so far as to seek the theater, theatrical applause, entering poetic contests, striving for the straw garlands and the vanity of theatrics and impertinent desires. In my private life, I was seeking to be purged from these corruptions of ours by carrying food to those who are called elect and holy, which in the laboratory of their stomachs they should make into angels and gods for us, and by them we might be set free. These projects I followed out and practiced with my friends who were both deceived with me and by me. Here's another quote on his education. <clears throat> what did it profit me that I could read and understand for myself all the books I could get on the so-called liberal arts when I was actually worthless slave of wicked lusts? I took a delight in them, not knowing the real source, that what was in them was true and certain. For I had my back towards the light and my face towards the things which the light falls on, so that my face, which looked toward the illumin illuminated things, was not itself illuminated. He's saying, I could look at things and see that they were true, but the light wasn't hitting me. I wasn't right. I couldn't think straight. And um, while this struggle for the meaning of life was going on, something else was complicating it. Um, he, in this relationship he had with this unknown, she's unnamed lady who stuck with him for many, many years, he had a mistress and the mistress had a son, right? 
So in those years, I had a mistress to whom I was not joined in lawful marriage. She was the woman I had discovered in my wayward passion, void as it was of understanding, yet she was, was the only one, and I remained faithful to her. And, and with her, I discovered by my own experience what a great difference there is between the restraint and the marriage bond contracted with a, a view of having children and the compact of a lustful love whereby children are born against the parent's will, although once they are born, they compel our love. So he had a son, he loved his son, but he felt compelled to love his son because it wasn't his wife that had the son, it was, it was his mistress. So he decides to go home to, 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 uh, back to his birthplace at Thagate, and he went back uh, first to Carthage, and he does this for only one reason, and that's to visit the world-famous Faustus who was coming into town. Faustus was a Manichaean, and he, Augustine had all these questions about Manichaeism, but everybody around him who were the head honchos couldn't explain it to him, and they would always say, you know, when Faustus comes to town, he'll make it straight with you. He'll answer all your questions, right? Just wait till Faustus gets here. Well, Faustus comes, and uh, they, they go out to, to try to have these discussions, and he says this, but all the endeavors I, uh, to make further progress in Manichaeism came completely to an end through my acquaintance with that man. I did not wholly separate from myself from them, but as one who had not yet found anything better, I decided to content myself for the, for the time being. For what ha, for, excuse me, with what I had stumbled upon in one way or another, until by chance something more desirable shall present itself. The problem was, this guy didn't have any more answers than the guys who were in town. He kept asking the questions, and this guy kept telling him crazy things that didn't make sense, and after a while, the guy didn't want to even hear the questions, he wouldn't allow him to talk. And they, they shut him down, and he's like, okay, I'm going to hang out with these guys, but I'm not one of them. I need to find something better. And so <clears throat> after that, he shortly goes to Milan for a, uh, a, a teaching position. And um, his mom came to visit with him, and it ends up being an extended stay. And she heard that he was no longer a Manichaean. She wasn't surprised. You would think she would be ecstatic over that. But since he wasn't a Christian, really, she just saw that as a small step and a breaking down of the darkness. And he says, her heart was not agitated with any violent exaltation like I expected, right? But he decided he wanted to go to Rome. He went to Milan. First, he goes to Rome. And the reason he goes to Rome is because he heard that there was more disciplined children in the classroom. And uh, <clears throat> he goes there. And then he starts talking to people, and then he, he comes up with a different uh, view of them. He said, these kids are spoiled. Because it's Rome, they're all rich, they all got money, they get in a classroom, and they just clown around, right? And, and um, he said he wanted to, to have a class of people who really grasped knowledge and sought after truth and all that, and all he's got was little, you know, little playful kids. And then he starts thinking back about himself as a student, and he said, this is a quote, the manners that I would not adopt as a student... I was compelled as a teacher to endure in others. And I think every teacher knows how that feels, man. You know, if you look back, I look back on the kind of student I was, and I was like, yep, I got what I deserve, I guess, right now, you know. And uh, that's, that's just the story of teachers, I guess. But he goes to Milan, and while in Milan, he meets the Bishop of Milan, Ambrose. And this is an important person because Ambrose was known as a very, very good preacher, a very good speaker. Augustine wanted to hear him speak. But um, it wasn't just that he was a good... He went to hear him speak, but what happens is Ambrose is able to preach in such a way that Augustine starts to take the Bible seriously. And, and the type of preaching that Ambrose did seemed to explain more, right? And he says this, to him I was led... Uh, to him I was led by thee without, without my knowledge, that by him I might be led to thee in full knowledge. That man of God received me as a father would and welcomed my coming as a good bishop should. And I began to love him, of course, not as the first, at first as the teacher of the truth, for I had entirely despaired of finding that in the church, but as a friendly man. I studiously listened to him, though not with the right motive, as he preached to the people. I was trying to discover whether his eloquence came up in his reputation and whether it flowed fuller or thinner than the others said it did. So I heard good things about him. I wanted to see for myself, right? And thus I hung on his words intently. But, but as to his subject matter, I was, only, I was only a careless and contemptuous listener. I was delighted with the charm of his speech, which was... 
<coughs> more erudite, though less cheerful and soothing than Faustus's si style. For as a subject matter, however, there could be no comparison. The latter was wandering around in Manichean deceptions while the former was teaching salvation most, sound, most soundly. And so there's a sense in which Augustine is driven to Christianity by the hollowness of everything else, right? He, he fell apart sexually, he fell, fell apart intellectually, on the job things were falling apart, uh, the students weren't what they should have been. And so his rejection of these other philosophies meant he had to go somewhere, and it was like Christ was wiping out all these other things so that Christ was standing there alone. He says, but I could not still, concerning the body of this world, the nature as a whole, now that I was able to consider and compare such things more and more, I now decided that the majority of the philosophers held more, more probable views. So that, in, so that in what I thought was the method of the academics, doubting everything and fluctuating between all the options, I came to the conclusion that the Manicheans were to be abandoned. For I judged even that period of doubt that I could not remain in, in a sect which preferred some to the philosophers. But I've refused to commit the cure of my fainting soul to the philosophers because they were without the saving name of Christ. I resolved, therefore, to become a catechumen in the Catholic Church, which my parents had so much urged upon me until something certain shone forth with which I might guide my course. What he said is, at that time, the way it was set up was this. Uh, we kind of have a new members class here. But if, if you were interested in Christianity, what you would do is join a class, and that class would go on for a year or maybe two. And that class would, would explain everything about Christianity to you. And as long as you stuck in class, you were going to learn more and more. And then at the at end of the class, at the end of the period of the class, you were straight up asked, are you going to become a Christian or not? And if you were, you got baptized, and you were in the church, and you stayed there. And if not, you moved on. But, but the class was before the Christianity. We tend, to, we tend to invite people to Christ, accept their salvation, and then teach them. They taught them first, and then asked them if they want to be saved, once they knew the whole picture. All right, um, there's some pros and cons to each, but I kind of uh, there's some things to be appreciated about that second way. He goes, his faith grows under Ambrose. He says, <clears throat> under Ambrose, Scripture seemed to make sense where it had offended me before, as to those passages in Scripture which adhered to poor appeared incongruous and offensive to me. Now that I had heard several of them expounded reasonably, I could see that they also resolved by the mysteries of the spiritual interpretation. The authority of Scripture seemed to me the more revered and worthy of devout belief because, although it was visible for all to read, it reserved its full majesty of its secret wisdom within its spiritual profundity. Now, here's a problem. Okay? Ambrose would preach an Old Testament passage that, that was a story, something like David and Goliath. And by the time he finished with that, David could mean anything, the rocks could mean anything, the giant could mean anything, and, and it was an allegory, right? And he, he preached in an allegorical method, and pr that's particularly easy to do when you look at narratives, the stories of the Bible, right? And so Ambrose was finding secret and interesting and plausible meanings in everything, and that really turned Augustine on. One of the things, though these guys are solidly in our Christian camp and we claim them, one of the things that we've learned from them, though, is we don't want to approach Scripture the way they do. We believe that Scripture has a meaning that is grounded in the words, and the words are not something you bounce off to to find the meaning, okay? And so the words are, are rooted and mean something. And so the story of David and Goliath was actually the story of a young man killing a giant and whatever meaning you take from that, you can't leave that story, okay? <coughs> so what you're seeing is he's slowly being pu pulled to Christ by uh, some very important figures like his mother praying for him, like, like, um, like uh, his friend Ansel, who is, who's the bishop of Milan, preaching. He's making the Bible believable. Uh, but also at the same time, God is wiping stuff out of his life. And he says, uh, he did, he, one of the problems that he turns to pretty quickly now is, is the problem of living with this woman. He knew this was getting to be a bigger and bigger problem. And what he tells his mom is, uh, start praying for a wife for me. And he says this prayer wasn't answered right off. He says, yet... 
when at my request and her own impulse, she called upon thee daily with strong and heartfelt cries that thou wouldst by a vision disclose her unto her, leading about, uh, leading about my future marriage, thou wouldst not. He wanted a vision about a wife. His mom wanted a vision about a wife. No vision came. Right? His mother has to go do it the old way. So she scraps together, scratches and finds this uh, arranged marriage with this young girl. But the girl was actually too young to get married. And so he had to wait two years to, for her to be marryable, which means she was 12 when the, when the arrangement was made and 14 when the marriage was supposed to take place. Um, <clears throat> Um, let me stay here for a second. Um, listen to what he says about his sins in marriage. He says, my mistress was torn from my side as an impediment to my marriage, and my heart, which clung to her, was torn and wounded till it bled. And she went back to Africa, vowing to thee never to know any other man, and leaving with me my natural son by her. But I, unhappy as I was, and the weaker and weaker than a woman, could not bear the delay of the two years that, I should, that should elapse before I could obtain the bride I sought. And so since I was not a lover of wedlock, as so much a slave of lust, I procured another mistress, not a wife, of course, thus in bondage to my lasting habit, the disease, the disease of my soul might be nursed upon and kept in its vigor or even increased until it reached the realm of matrimony. Nor, nor indeed was the wound healed that had been caused by cutting away my former mistress. Only it ceased to burn and throb and began to fester and was more dangerous because it was less painful. So he gets rid of his long-standing mistress, but doesn't want to wait in abstinence for two years, so he picks up another. Meanwhile, he's got the son from the first relationship. Right? And <clears throat> when you read Confessions, you see him bounce around between intellectual problems and sexual problems, moral problems. And both of these things have him twisted in knots. He said, uh, well, let me, let me skip this part. He, uh, one of the things he says is, but, but, the one thing, uh, but the one thing that, that lifted me up towards thy light was that I had come to know that I had a will, and it was certainly as I knew that I had uh, life. When therefore I willed, or was unwilling to do something, I was utterly certain that it was none but myself who willed or was unwilling, and immediately I realized that there was, that there was the cause of my sin. He, he knew he couldn't blame this on anybody else. He couldn't, blame, he couldn't blame anybody for the sex, for the immorality. He couldn't blame it for anything, but he understood that he had a free will and that he, his free will was freely choosing sin. However, he at the same time realized his will was not that free because he couldn't stop. That was his problem. <clears throat> By thinking through this, as well as experiencing evil, he'd come to accept the fact that he was the one who was really doing the wrong. Um, he eventually works through this intellectual barrier that Christianity had. He could, he could see himself as a Christian. Christianity didn't insult his intelligence anymore. But the problem, the problem was that when he understood it, it didn't help his moral situation. And here's, Am, Am, uh, Ambrose is preaching on Paul, and he hears, uh, Augustine hears Paul says, you know what, it's better to be single like me than encumbered by marriage. And Augustine thought, you know, if being a Christian, I mean really being a Christian, hard out being a Christian, means you have to live a life of abstinence, I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that, you know. And, and um, he, 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 has a, he has a famous, um, he has this famous quote that kind of gets his struggle. Listen to what he says. But wretched youth that I was, supremely, supremely wretched, even at the very outset of my youth, I had entreated chastity of thee. What he's saying is, I asked you for chastity, Lord. I entreated chastity of thee and had prayed, grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> but not yet. Right? For I was afraid, lest thou should hear me too soon, and too soon cure me of my disease of lust, which I desired to have satisfied rather than extinguished. That's amazing. That's some honesty right there. 
Well, <clears throat> two of his friends come by, and they start telling him of a guy, a famous monk named St. Anthony. And St. Anthony lived in the desert for a long time and spent decades of his life denying himself of things, the basics of life. Anthony went without. And, and the perspective Anthony took was not that I'm getting rid of these things to be holy, but he, he doesn't, he would rather have the joys found in Christ than these things. That's how Anthony writes this, right? And, and yet, as he's hearing this story, Augustine resonates with that feeling, but also knows he doesn't want to put down his lust, right? And, and I'm going to read a, a long quote. This is probably at the end. And this is how the coin finally drops for Augustine. He, grabs his, he grabbed his friend, Alipus, and yelled at him, What is the matter with us? What is this? What did you hear? The unstructured startup and take of heaven, and we, with all our learning but so little heart, see where we wallow in flesh and blood? Because others have gone out before us, we are ashamed to follow, and not rather ashamed at not following? I scarcely knew what I said. In my excitement, I flung away from him while he gazed at me in silent astonishment. The tempest in my breast hurried me out into this garden where no one might interrupt the fiery struggle in which I was engaged with myself and until it came into the outcome that thou knowest, though I did not. I was, I was mad for health and dying for life, knowing what evil thing I was, but not knowing what good thing I was to short, so shortly to become. It was, in fact, my old mistresses, trifles of trifles and vanity of vanities, who still enthralled me. They tugged at my fleshly garments and so softly whispered to me, Are you going to part with us? And from that moment, we will never be without you anymore? And from that moment, will this and that be forbidden for you forever? What, what were they suggesting to me in those words, this or that? So you see, you see him being pulled by these ladies, that, you know, in his mind? He said, That I might give away to my tears and my lamentations, I stole away from Alypius, for it seemed to me that solitude was more appropriate for the business of weeping. I flung myself down under a fig tree, I know, I know not, and gave free course with my tears. The streams of my eyes gushed out an acceptable sacrifice to thee, and not indeed in these words, but to this effect I cried to thee, and thou, O Lord, how long, how long, O Lord, will thou be angry forever? O remember not against us our former iniquities." <clears throat> I was saying these things and weeping in the most bitter contrition of my heart. Then suddenly I heard the voice of a boy or a girl, I don't know which, coming from the neighborhood house, chanting over and over again, pick it up, read it, pick it up, read it. Immediately I ceased weeping and began most earnestly to think of whether it was unusual for children in some kind of game to sing such a song. But I could not remember ever hearing the like of it before. So damning the torrent of my tears, I got to my feet, for I could not think but what this was the divine command to open the Bible and read the first passage I should light upon. So I quickly returned to the bench where Olympus was sitting, for there I had put down the apostle's book when I had left there. I snatched it up, opened it, and in the silence read the paragraph in which my eyes first fell. And this is a quote from, from Paul. It says, not in rioting and in drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. How amazing he would grab that verse, huh? That's Romans 13, 13. He said, I wanted to read no further, nor did I need to, for instantly the sentence ended, there was infused in my heart something like a light full of certainty, and all the gloom of doubt vanished away. Closing the book then, and putting my finger in something else for ellipses, closing the book then, and putting my finger or something else there for a mark, I began now with a tranquil countenance to tell it all to ellipses. And in turn, he disclosed to me what had been going on in himself, which I knew nothing about. He asked to see what I had read. I showed him, and when he looked, he looked even further down than I had read. He had not known what followed, I, excuse me, I had not known what followed, but indeed it was this, him that is weak in the faith, receive. That's Romans 14.1. This he applied to himself and told me. By these words of warning, he was strengthened by exercising this good resolution and purpose, all very much in keeping with his character, in which these respects, he was always far from different and better than I. He joined me in full commitment without any restless hesitation. The two of them got saved at the same time reading these passages. Okay, 
<coughs> Let me just tell you the epilogue. Everything changed for him at this point. In, in preparation for his baptism, Augustine quit his teaching on rhetoric. He was baptized by uh, St. Ambrose, and uh, this happened along with his son. His son also got saved at this time. His son's name was Adiotius, but you don't know that till the very end of the book. He just keeps calling him my son, my son. But he and his son get baptized at the same time. His mother, Monica, is able to watch that happen. She sees her, her, her son, who she's been praying for all the time, and her grandson, uh, through, this, through this mistress, uh, get baptized. They decide to go back home th to Thagaste in Africa, and it was decided that he and his friends were going to start a monastery there where he would teach priests. So he quits his job, and they start to come home. When they, get, when they get on the way home in a place called Ostia, they had to wait for a ship. <clears throat> Monica gets sick there and dies. She literally dies months after watching him get baptized, right? And uh, it was kind of interesting. When, when, she was, when she was dying, it was obvious she was going to die, they asked her what she thought about being buried in this city where she, she was just passing through. She didn't know anybody there. She says, she says this. Uh, about being buried where she doesn't know. She goes, nothing is far from God. I don't fear that in the end of time he should not know the place in where she should resurrect me. <laughs> My body might be lost, but God's going to remember, right? And so uh, they go back home. Two years after this, Idotius, his son, dies as well. Along with this, two other friends um, they die. I, I listed them in their program. So with, with, after he comes and, and gets saved, within three, three or four years, he loses a lot of people that are very close to him. <coughs> he, he decided to start, uh, the, they, they decided not to go to the hometown, but rather to Hippo to start up the monastery. And the reason he picked Hippo was because there was already an established bishop. He didn't want to go to his hometown where he would become the, the go-to guy for everything spiritual and religious. He wanted to be underneath somebody, and so he thought, if I go to Hippo, I'll just be a priest, I'll do my, I'll do my monastery work, and nobody will bother me. Well, that didn't really happen like that. The, the bishop eventually, or not too eventually, in a short period, he leaves, and not long after becoming a priest, he's also made a bishop, and he spends his, the rest of his life basically there in Hippo, on the coast of Africa, and he writes and he teaches and he comments on things from there. He also does what all bishops have to do, settle disagreements, uh, do, do judgments where, where people within the congregation, uh, whether it's property issues or relationships, all that kind of stuff, eventually comes to the bishop and he has to deal with that. And um, <clears throat> the book closes with the prayer that I put in your, in your uh, notes there. And it's basically, he closes with a prayer concerning Monica and Patricius and some other folks. But, but this is uh, the end. It says, but where, the, but where was my free will during all those years, and from what deep secret retreat was it called forth in a single moment, whereby I gave my neck to the, thy easy yoke and my, soul, my shoulders to their light burden? O oh, Jesus, my strength and my redeemer. He, he, said, he said, how did I choose to take on your light yoke? How did I choose to take on your light burden? He said, how sweet did it suddenly become to me without the sweetness of trifles, and it was now a joy to put away what I formerly feared to lose. For thou didst cast them away from me, O true and high sweetness. Thou didst cast them away, and in their place thou didst enter thyself, sweeter than all pleasure, though not flesh and blood, brighter than all light, but more veiled than all mystery, more exalted than all honor, though not to them that are exalted in their own eyes." Now, now was my soul free from the gnawing cares of seeking and getting, of wallowing in the mire and scratching in the itch of, of lust. I prattled like a child to thee, O oh my God, my light, my riches, and my salvation. I want to end it there uh, and just, just kind of... Uh, one of the things that I think he brings out really well, which is a theme that some of my favorite theologians have, you see this in Jonathan Edwards as well, is that <clears throat> we tend to have a model of, of seeing sin and hating sin 
and wanting to put it away and needing God's grace to put it away and provide salvation for us. And, and, and we concentrate on that. There is also a theme in Scripture in which all that sinning is really you trying to get something that is better than you have, you pursuing something that, that you don't have, and you chasing after it as hard as you can. And in the end, if you get it, it doesn't satisfy. If you don't get it, you're irritated. But the pursuing and the chasing is actually a good thing. The problem is you don't want it the right way. What fills that hole, what provides the joy, what gives you pleasure is God. And so, I mean, think about this. Think about this as you talk about, you know, evangelism with people and things like that. Your problem isn't that they have pleasures uh, in general that turn out to be sinful pleasures. Even the ones that are not necessarily sinful are irreverent. You know, the love of family more than the love of God, that kind of thing, is irreverent, right? The problem is not that they have desires. The problem is they're willing to settle for a weaker goal. The, pr the problem needs to be satisfied by having your pleasure set in God and that God being the supreme pleasure of your life. And so you see this theme throughout what he's written is that I was chasing things as hard as I could hoping that they would provide something for me. I didn't get what I was after until I got Christ. Then I got what I was after. Right? So how does, how does for example, how does, sexual, how does sexual love get satisfied? By being satisfied in Christ and loving within his design of marriage. Right? And in that way, Jesus, uh, C.S. Lewis points this out as well. It's, it's the... Uh, it's the idea of, of the order of your loves. If you seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, you'll get it. But if you seek after the other things, you won't get the first thing and you won't get the second things either. But if you seek after God and his righteousness, what all these other things are provided to you. Right? But if you go chasing secondary things, you're constantly thirsty. You're constantly wanting. Right? Right? I'm going to open it up for questions or thoughts. Pat, did you say that he was a priest um, before he was a bishop of Hippo? Yes, he was a priest for a very short time, then he became a bishop. Okay. Would he have, um, being a priest, is that consistent what we know today in the Catholic, um, really Roman Catholic? It was not as elaborate. Uh, and a lot of things that, that we see about Catholicism today are not established until after his lifetime. Some of the things that we find most egregious about Catholicism really take time to develop. And so I would say it's a bad comparison, actually. Okay. There, um, there's some things I don't agree with Augustine with. There's some things that, that uh, well, even like the way he interprets Scripture sometimes is not good. But, but the, the idea of what he thinks about salvation, justification by faith... He's very Pauline in all his thinking there, and those are the very points we'd have problems with the Catholic Church today. So I think, I think the things that most bother us about the Catholic Church that we think are most egregious are not true of especially him and not, not common in his day. Okay. Hey, uh, it's, it seemed like he, was he did he kind of waver in between uh, his, his, his uh, understanding of free will? Because on the one hand, it seems that he would... <coughs> Uh, when he talked about how he he was freely choosing evil, and that seemed to have a, a basically how we would say here, where your will is free to choose within the realms of your own nature in a way that's unforced. So right. the only thing that a sinful person wants to do is sin. Right. And then it seemed he seemed to say that, but then he came back and said, "Well, I really wasn't free at all." Right. Both of those can't be true. Right. What uh, in his in his writing, free will is really tied to the problem of evil. Okay, and, and here's the problem. Where does evil come from? And he, he, he obviously can't find it in God, right? You can't find evil in God in any way. And so it must be a part of the creation. So he looks at angels and, who are fallen. You know, they have, they have will and they fall, some of them. And then he looks at man, and particularly Adam and Eve. And um, what, what he says by this is evil has to be generated in those decisions, 
has to be generated um, from them choosing evil, both, both the angels who fall as well as Adam and Eve. That, that's where you have to say, because if you don't say it's in the creation, you have to say it's in the creator, and that can't be. So, so how is evil generated? By men choosing to do evil, okay? And, and so that means you have to be able to choose. Now, he was also surrounded with some philosophies that said, that says, uh, it, it kind of, some of the philosophers that he paid attention to would say that um, when you do something wrong, it's not necessarily you who's doing it, it's something inside of you that chooses wrong. And, and they, they, what they were trying to do was give room for them to be, think of themselves as good people, first of all, and clear thinkers, secondly. And so they can, they can think well of themselves, they can think clearly, because they're not actually doing the wrong, it's something inside them that's doing it, right? He, he rejected that because he says, you know, from my experience, I'm the one choosing it. I, I stole the pears, I picked the girls, I was doing the choosing. And so when it came to guilt and responsibility, he recognized that he was the one who was choosing to do evil. And so in that sense, his will was free. But, but when, you, when he looks at the idea of getting rid of his sin and stopping the sinning, like stop picking up these girls, you know, divorce myself from my mistress and don't pick up another one. He couldn't do it. And, and, and that's, why he, that's why even in that prayer that I wrote in, the, in, in your program, he implies that I have a free will, but you are moving me. And, and he sees the hand of God in everything. He sees the hand of God in, in allowing him to do evil so that he would hate his sin, even, which is kind of interesting. But... Um, so I wouldn't say it's a very, it's not, there are cracks in the, in the logic, but he pieces together his understanding of will as something that we must have because we have to choose evil or else God's doing it. But secondly, I realize that my will is so structured that I can't get rid of my sin. And so the two things are kind of existing there together. Hang on. Uh, I would just add to, to what Pat said that um, when it comes to the freedom of the will, uh, in the Reformed faith, the freedom of the will is a reality that is taught, but it's not the defining of the freedom of the will that's the issue. It's the moral paradigm that, that undergirds it. So uh, we, be we would believe that man has a free will. We would just believe that the moral paradigm is not the capacity of choosing good and evil. Yeah, so, and, and, right. and, and, and I, I think that it, I think in, in, in Augustine's writings that becomes clear, especially when he begins dealing with um, uh, Pelagianism, uh, where, where he begins to define his perspective on the will much more clearly. But, um, so, you know, uh, the, the language of, of free will is something that we would affirm, although <coughs> we would define its paradigm of course, much differently than a Pelagian or a, a semi uh, would. Uh, give one to Don and then one to Ms. Bragg, please. His mother seemed to have a long and sustained Christian life over a long period of time. What kind of group, group if any, was she involved with or where was she getting all, all of her uh, spiritual food from? Say that again one more time. Where was she getting her spiritual food from? I mean, she right. seemed to be a lo long-term, right. strong Christian believer. She, she, she was a very uh, strong, and most of what we know about her, we know from him. And, and he sees her as a very um, strong and faithful woman who not only, um, not only was saying the right things, but doing the right things in a house that was not easy to live in. Okay, there's this one, it was not easy to live in it. There's this one thing, and again, cultures are different. Um, you can take from this what you want. But there was this one situation in which these women had gotten together, and they were all complaining that their husbands had beat them, right? She, didn't, she hadn't been beaten. And she, she said, you know, if you'll keep your mouth shut, you may not get beaten. You know, which, I, that's not good advice for a battered woman. I'm not saying that's good. But... But that's what she said, and, and what that shows is she had learned in her house how to have self-control for her own safety, first of all, but I think ultimately for the gospel as well. And, and um, 
again, I don't go home and tell anybody I said that was good advice for battered women. That's not what I said. But they were much more violent. I mean, for example, Augustine uh, got beat all the time at school. It was whatever was culturally appropriate. I'm not making apologies for that or explaining it. It just happened, okay? That's not good. But, but the, point, the point I'm making is that she, she had learned to live in a difficult place, and she had learned how to live Christianity in a difficult place. And um, it, Augustine says that it was her piety that led her husband eventually to get saved just months or maybe a year before he died. You know, where she got that from was your question. I don't really know. I don't know. Yeah, there were churches there. I, I, and, and she went to church, but I don't, you know, was, was that the source of it? I'm not sure, yeah. But she was definitely in the church. You know, she's actually, um, you hear the word St. Augustine. He's a saint, but Monica's a saint, too. She, she has her own saint day and all that kind of stuff. I just want to publicly thank uh, James Marshall II. He did a lot of uh, research for Pat and I. We asked him, Pat had asked him to, to do some uh, preliminary research for us that he turned over to us to kind of help us in the process. So I just want to publicly thank James for his work uh, and uh, giving us some a good pre, pre-study of this that we could use. I know he's not here, but I just wanted to make that he's public on the internet. statement. He's on the internet watching. Yay, yeah, James. Very helpful. Very helpful. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out by saying uh, tomorrow we're going to look at uh, the other famous book. We're not, I'm not going to do it the same way. I'm not going to read to you from the book like I did. Um, so we're going we're gonna to handle it a little bit differently, but we're going to look at the city of God. 